Welcome to the webinar, How Will a COVID-19 Vaccine Be Delivered? Presented by the International Vaccine Access Center at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Before we get started, I wanna let participants know that we will have a short Q&A section at the end, so please enter your questions into the Q&A box and we will get to them after the presentation. Any questions we do not address, we can follow up with individually after the webinar. There is also a chat box so please go ahead and introduce yourself there and enter comments that aren't questions. During the presentation, a couple of polls will be used, so please submit your answer when they appear. This webinar will be recorded and thank you for attending. I will now hand it off to Maria to introduce the speakers in today's presentation. Thank you, Andrew. Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. I am Maria Deloria Knoll. I'm the Director of Epidemiology at the International Vaccine Access Center at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And I'm joined by my colleagues, Noor Barzev, who is IVAC's Deputy Director, and Lois Preverdum, the Senior Advisor for Policy Advocacy and Communications and our Director for Adult Vaccines. We'll be going through an interactive session of what it will take to deliver a COVID-19 vaccine in a less than perfect scenario where we have a constrained supply. We will be looking at the considerations at both the global and the country level and how we can integrate these pieces to uh, realize a cohesive strategy to achieve optimal impact. I will be the moderator for today and I'll start by turning it over to my colleague, Lois. Great, thanks Maria. When we think about delivery or what happens after a vaccine or vaccines are licensed, you may come up with an image like the one that's showing on the screen, a mind-boggling push and pull of different priorities and considerations to make sure that the people that need the vaccine can get it. There are a number of considerations, including demand, supply, financing, ethics, politics, stakeholders, and more that all come together. We'll take you through many of these elements, also hearing from you to build a greater understanding of what goes into delivery planning. This is a very dynamic process, and I think what we need to remember is that no one has clear answers at this stage. But at the end, we'll offer some suggestions and a framework on integrating the global discussions with your voice of experience from countries and the individual organizations you represent, as well as some of the things that we need, we think need to happen to make this all work. We also have to remember that this needs to be viewed through not only a public health lens, but an economic and social justice lens. The world is very divided now, and now is the time to recognize that we need to do things differently and accept some, some risks that are going to build more voices to the vaccine discussion and find solutions that work for multiple countries and populations. The solutions are not to be high income or low income, but we must do more to recognize the typologies of countries that view COVID-19 and priorities very differently then we can all start progressing towards an equitable, just, and effective new normal. Next slide, please. The first thing we need to consider are the various vaccination strategies that countries might prioritize. These priorities are influenced by realities of program capacity and structure of the health system that may not be set up for immunizations of all age groups, the number of doses that we're potentially talking about, the politics that exist today, financing, or how well the vaccine, individual vaccines can address various target populations. Each country will have different objectives and those objectives we need to remember may actually shift over time. The goal at the global level is to consider all of these country needs and provide an ethical fr framework that addresses a fair allocation of vaccine doses. And the chevron that you see here is a continuum of possible strategies that could be considered by countries. There are many variations, but most countries will start to immunize their health workers. Although we do have to rec recognize that there may be countries that don't even do that. And then they may go to vulnerable groups who are perhaps at higher risk because of age or higher risk because of comorbid conditions or other factors. Then um, going 
towards the right of the chevron, we're, we're thinking about getting into essential workers, a category that's really important, not only because they may be at higher risk of contracting disease or transmitting disease, but also for economic reasons. Uh, this is a strategy for opening up the economy and protecting in infrastructure. Ideally, we'd love to see the uh, population immunity at the end of the chevron be achieved, but this is going to be a quite a, a challenging goal. This is what's going to be needed to return back to what our normal was, but it will depend on having enough supply capability to execute the strategies and the demand for the products, because we know already that certain populations may, may not uh, actually want a vaccine. Next slide, please. So country strategies on the previous slide are combined to come up with a global number. And the numbers that you see on the bottom of the slide give you a sense of the magnitude of dose requirements. And I do want to put a caveat there. These, these are not forecasts, but they are designed to give you a magnitude of the different groups. And the other thing to re remember is that these uh, these volumes are also considering a single dose. We know that certain doses, uh, certain vaccines will require a second dose or require uh, re-immunization after a season or a particular point in time. So those numbers could increase uh, by a certain level. We need to consider the, the timing that we're going to implement these strategies because, again, it will change over time as more doses become available, as we gain more knowledge about the disease. So there's a number of factors that are, are moving targets. But um, the, the message here is that if we start at the very beginning when we're likely to get doses, and let's say we have a um, what in some cases would be considered a large number of doses, but doesn't actually go so far. So if you look at uh, just health workers, that number could be eaten up very quickly. Let's say you have 100 million doses and you have to also consider buffer stock or putting uh, aside some products for stockpiles or considering wastage of vaccines. So we really will need to be introducing these vaccines in phases. And just because a country wants a number of doses doesn't mean that we can deliver it to them. So there's many factors that can easily also reduce uh, demand and that, that's also important. So we really do need to get the forecast right. The last thing we wanna see is what happens is that countries are demanding a certain number of doses, but at the end, we have more supply than there actually is demand or that certain countries that needed more doses couldn't get them because they're going to another country. But we'll talk about those things that influence uh, what a country can get and how we can prepare for some of these inevitable ch challenges. But first, we're gonna go to our first poll. Thank you, Lois. In uh, just a moment, you should see a poll pop up on your screen where you can choose the answer that you must agree with. For this poll, we would like you to take the perspective of a global team tasked with making the tough decision of how to allocate COVID-19 vaccine given a scenario where only 100 million doses are available for the world. So please check the answer that you most agree with. There are no right or wrong answers and your answer won't be linked to you. This is just to get a sense of if we are all on the same page or not. And if you want to include reasons for your choice, you can explain that in the chat box. So I'll give us a little time to, to read these questions and for you to respond. Looks like a lot of votes have come in so far, about two thirds there. We're getting already quite a number of questions on the chat, which is great. Um, some of these uh, issues that we'll get to later on in the talk. So do keep the questions coming through. Yeah. 
So Andrew, that's that's good. Two thirds is good. Wow. So so it looks like um, there's a number of people that are saying that they would go to the countries with the worst burden. But some are really saying equally divided by the population and based on the capacity of delivering vaccines. So um, one of the things that is, actually it's encouraging that very few people answered the it's a private market anyway. Uh, we hope that that's not what, uh, what will happen. I think there is a good commitment to uh, making this a global good. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, but the worst burden is something that we also need to consider because not all countries have uh, the same capability of measuring their burden and reporting their burden. So that's another thing that we need to think about. But th there's a number of interesting perspectives here. Yeah, Lois, I think it's um, interesting to see that one might imagine that a country that has the worst burden um, may also be a country where the capacity to deliver might be, uh, might be an issue. Um, and I'm not just talking about sort of low income countries or, or, you know, in the United States, we're seeing a very high burden and, and we're having difficulty even rolling out testing and, and contact tracing. And I imagine that that might also be an issue with um, the vaccine delivery. So some of these things, we want them to be both be there, but they may be mutually exclusive. Um, let's, let's move to the next slide. Um, I think what we're seeing um, really is a variety of views on allocation. Uh, presumably reflects a variety of views also on what targets uh, we want to we want to reach um, and what the specific challenges or concerns are for each respondent and obviously the same will be true for for, for countries um, if we can define what our end game is if we can define what our strategic targets are that we want to achieve then we kind of have to ask the question of how do we bridge the gap between that ideal and the real the, the situation that we're in and how what are the practical steps that we need to make our strategy work in our specific and local context. And there are a number of considerations that we need to think about now as we dig down deeper uh, into this answer. So let's consider, for example, the target of healthcare workers. A relatively modest goal, 70 million or roughly thereabouts in terms of doses, presumably a high acceptance among that population, although that's not necessarily uh, an assumption that shouldn't be uh, tested. Um, they are in workplaces where perhaps delivery is, is achievable. Um, but the purpose of vaccinating them is because there's a presumption that they're at higher risk. And uh, there's been some variability uh, across countries in whether or not healthcare workers have really been, uh, you know, disproportionately affected by, by COVID-19. And it may also relate to the availability, availability of PPE. If PPE is well adhered to, then perhaps the risks are lower. Uh, where, where it's not available, perhaps the risks are higher. So there are things to consider when we're planning for that. If we were to think about older adults, then um, there's a real question about what's the platform for delivery. Many countries, or in fact all countries, have platforms to deliver vaccines to infants, and some countries have also adolescent vaccination. Some countries have uh, uh, maternal vaccines, vaccines in, during pregnancy. Uh, but very few countries have platforms that, are, that exist and are, uh, that, that are uh, available to scale for targeting older adults. Older adults uh, represent uh, varying proportions of, total, of the total populations in different countries. And older adults live in different settings. There are older adults who live independently alone, and there are adults that um, perhaps at the older age of the spectrum uh, uh, in institutions. How are those adults to be reached? How do we even know about them and where they live and, and whether they exist? Do we have the mechanisms to do that? That's something that's not being done before, and now might be the time to actually think about that. If we want to think about a broader range of comorbid conditions and persons at broader definitions of high risk, well, how do we define that higher risk and how do we identify those individuals? Do we want to know about everybody who has hypertension? Do we want to know about everybody who has obesity? Um, would they want us to know about them in that way? How do we track them? How do we reach them? Uh, if, if we expect that vaccination will be de delivered centrally and we ask for people to congregate to receive vaccination, that itself poses risk of transmission. So we have to be very careful and think about that. Um, we've already spoken a bit about what does essential, an essential worker mean, and we've said that this is to some degree an economic decision also. But if the issue here is one of getting essential workers to work, uh, then we have to think about what happens to their families and their children during that time. Uh, do we have to open schools and have them available? If we have schools, 
maybe we need to vaccinate those children. So perhaps there's, in some settings at least, uh, if our target is essential workers, we are actually multiplying by several, the several factors, the doses that are required if we're targeting the workers themselves and their families. And when it comes to the total population, or at least a large proportion of the population, 70, 80%, then we really have to think about whether it's feasible, whether it needs to be a near-term goal or a long-term goal, and what are the things that need to be put in place in terms of procurement, in terms of manufacturing, in terms of delivery to make uh, that even possible. Um, clearly, those decisions will also be dependent on the products. We've already received quite a large number of questions about products. So you know, what are the features that make um, a product that can address each of those things? Um, let's move to the next slide. And now that we've thought more deeply about the target populations, um, the strategies will depend on having the right vaccine. So there's a lot of attributes of a vaccine that will make it more or less appropriate for different strategies. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the delivery standpoint that we need to think about and the things that we can control or plan for to uh, work with the products that are available we'll need to be thinking about storage and transportation, things like vial size, uh, something that's often not uh, a lot of thought is put into, but can make a very big difference depending on what the nature of the population that you're immunizing is, you know, whether it's a lot of people or few people. The, um, how you ensure appropriate administration, disposal, and more. Next slide, please. So now that we've, uh, we, we do know that we're going to need multiple vaccines and none of the vaccines will cover all of the needs, but there are several promising candidates. So this is a good thing. And this chart shows some of the, the front runners that are in process. So in the blue shaded areas, I've highlighted the benefits of some of the vaccines and you can see the different technologies here. But I wanna focus on just a couple of things. First is uh, single dose. And uh, this was one of the questions that I saw in, in the chat and that you know, we don't know whether uh, these vaccines will enable single dose or multi-dose, but some of the technologies will lend themselves more to a single dose vaccine than others. And uh, so that's still being tested, but it has a lot of implications on whether people will be coming back or not. One of the things that you see with influenza vaccine is that when you're talking about having to be revaccinated various uh, seasons, that's problematic. With other vaccines, having to get the second dose means that you need some type of system or registry to be able to address uh, people and call them back and make sure that you remind them. So there's a lot of implications on demand there. So ideally, we do want a single dose vaccine, of course. Uh, but other considerations, if you look over at the uh, right hand side under other considerations, adjuvants are important. This is something that are important for certain vaccines to ensure that the uh, response to the vaccine will be um, enhanced because it is difficult. I think now are mentioned already immunosenescence, which happens in older populations. So we want to see vaccines that are more potent and can work in these older populations to see a better immune response. But on the flip side of that, certain adjuvants cause concern amongst certain people. There's uh, anti-vaccine activists that don't like to see any additional ingredients and the perceived safety concerns become an issue. Now it will vary by adjuvant, but that is something that you need to keep in mind. And then storage requirements is another big one. Um, this is something that we know already may be complicated a bit by um, uh, certain technologies. So for instance, for the new mRNA vaccines, those are vaccines that will require minus 80 degrees uh, storage temperatures, which is for, before they're uh, used, they can go into regular cold chain for a period of time. But what that means is that the vaccines need to be used very quickly, which can be a real challenge in some countries. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. 
The good news is um, it's, it sounds daunting and it sounds like a daunting challenge, but it has been done just at a smaller scale. So we need to be able to weigh some of the considerations of scale versus just being able to do things. Next slide, please. Okay, we're at our next poll. We've talked about some of the challenges to global allocation and next we'll be talking about the country considerations and we've seen a lot of questions to this in the chat um, and the Q&A already. So in preparation for that, we'd like for you to tell us what you think your country's greatest challenge is going to be in implementing a COVID-19 vaccination plan. So Andrew's just opened the poll and if you could pick the response that best represents the perspective of the country that that you know best or that you represent. Um, it's likely that more than one uh, response might apply, but uh, maybe pick the, the one that you're most concerned about. And in this poll, we've also included an option in number seven for you to write your own if you don't see what you're looking for here. And if you check that one, just please go to the chat and um, tell us what your other is. And feel free to put any other comments in the chat box as well. We'll give you a few minutes to uh, answer this one. We're getting quite a few others, which is good. All right, we're right around uh, two thirds again, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna close it out. Affordability is. Um, one option that's not on here. So what are we seeing here? Oh, it looks like acceptance by the public is, is going to be a big one. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about, about that particular issue in uh, some coming slides, because we also do have some concerns there. Uh, ability to get the vaccine to all parts of the country, that uh, clearly is a concern. And plans to reach vulnerable populations, I think, is, is a big one. Uh, competing priorities, it would, um, that is something that we are seeing. And particularly in areas where COVID-19 is, is not the biggest concern at this point in time, the question is what's going to happen there. Uh, Nora, I don't know if you have anything more that you want to add on that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit surprised at the, the uh, high level of acceptance, I mean, the high level of, of concern around acceptance. And I think it, it's right. And we, you know, we, I, before the COVID crisis, we not long before had a measles crisis. And, uh, you know, we know how important uh, these challenges are at the moment. And it was identified by the WHO as a, as a global priority. Um, and we've all but forgotten almost about that priority when we got swept up in, 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 in COVID. But that issue still exists and I think it'll inform the way we engage with communities as we go forward uh, with introducing a vaccine once one is available. Yeah, That's and it, it's interesting to, to see the diversity of yeah. uh, the, the results. And that's something that goes into the next slide that we're going to be looking at. And Andrew, can you go to the next slide? So, um, and close, thanks. So one of the things that we see is that all countries are not created alike. Uh, they have different priorities and uh, different ways of uh, dealing with problems and setting up their systems, et cetera. So what I'm showing you here is some of the research that we've been doing at IVAC. We've been looking at adult vaccines more specifically. And this was work that was done uh, pre-COVID, but has a lot of relationship to what's happening right now and needing to think about how do we re reach older populations? Countries have a lot of experience with dealing with, with children, but do they have the systems and the capacities to get vaccines to, uh, in this case, it was older adults. So this is a study that we call an archetype analysis. Uh, another term might be typologies. But we looked at, um, so this was a mixed method study and uh, we did qualitative research with a number of countries and then a desk review for the re remainder and did an analysis. And what you'll see is two different axes. One is showing decision-making and the other is implementation. 
So we rated each country based on certain attributes that contributed to how likely they were to uh, perform on decision making versus implementation, remembering that this is adult vaccines and not childhood vaccines. And for anybody more interested in the methodology, this is published in vaccine or we're happy to talk about it. But I do want to focus in a couple of different areas and explain the colors that you're seeing here. So there's a group of countries that have um, strong decision making and really good processes to be able to go through some of these um, some of these systems or some of these questions that will be needed. But a lot of variability when it comes to implementation. So they may struggle with certain things about you know whether they're able to provide access for older adults or whether they have the registries available or whether they have the policies in place for older adults. So there is variability. But there's a group of countries that act um, somewhat similar on certain angles. The red is health security, meaning that a decision was made based on a health security event. But I do want to turn to the countries in yellow, which are at the bottom. And um, you know, one of the things that I think really jumps out at us is that we traditionally think of high income countries and low income countries as being quite different. But the message here is that that's not necessarily what you want to look at when you look at some of the challenges that countries face. And certain countries may focus on certain things as priorities. It has nothing to do with uh, well, it has something to do, but it's not always something that has to do with the level of income that people have. So the caution here is to think about how countries approach uh, different issues and understanding what they prioritize and where the gaps are can help us prepare. So this is an opportunity to think about how can we look at uh, countries differently and their needs to help solve various issues. Next slide, please. On this slide, um, we had talked about acceptance and that came out very strongly during the poll. And one of the things that we're finding, this is a, an example of a study that is coming from the US, but it could be applied to another, um, another country or other situations. And I think one of the things that's important here is to understand that not all of the public has the same view towards the vaccine that we might think they are have. So what's somewhat surprising is that half of the country is um, saying that they don't want to get a COVID-19 vaccine or they wouldn't at this point in time. Remembering that opinions are dynamic and they may change over time, but for the time being, there's 20% of the US population that says they absolutely don't want to get a vaccine and another 30% that are unsure. Going over to the age categories, you see something a little bit different there that's important to consider in your strategies. And that's that older adults do want the vaccine. So for the, those over 60, only 12% said they wouldn't get the vaccine. And of fairly large majority said that they would want the vaccine. The question is, and this was one of the questions that um, has come up through some of the chats, and I'm getting some of them, but not all of them. We'll try and handle those later. But one that uh, stuck out was, was a question about how is this vaccine going to be uh, working in older adults? And that's something that we have yet to see. And it will be a real challenge to have a vaccine that's effective in older adults. It is in the target product profile, so we know that there will be a minimal effectiveness in older adults, so at least 50%, but we need to set expectations. Then going over to the race category, the other part that is, is really quite surprising that we need to consider is, you know, the populations that have a disproportionate impact from the disease and whether they have the level of trust that they need. 
we can't take for granted that just because a group is at high risk that they're going to be demanding the vaccine. And in fact, with African Americans in the US, you see just the opposite. There's a bit of, there's distrust, there's um, lack of information, lack of um, convenience. And one of the things that we also need to be thinking about is who is actually providing care and who is, um, who is communicating to them. So one of the things that we saw through this particular paper was that um, when there was discordance in race between the healthcare provider and the person that um, is answering this question, that there is more distrust. So those are things that in our strategies we'll need to be thinking through. Next slide, please. Yeah, Lois, I just want to chime in for a second, if, if Andrew, go back to the previous slide. Um, I think a couple of things actually come to my mind. The, the, you know, in, in, if you go to the age categories, you know, we, we spoke about the end game at the end being population immunity and, and a large proportion of the population being covered. That implies not just older adults, but young people. If, if acceptance among young people is low or if the self-perception of risk is low and why should I be vaccinated for the herd or at least that we have to dig into what's behind mm -hmm. the yeah. but you know, it's going to be very hard to achieve. And then the other thing I just want to say about acceptance that's come up in the, in the poll and it's come up here again is, is the very closely related issue of safety uh, and pharmacovigilance, uh, both real and perceived. You know, we know from the early uh, trials on, on or the early developments of, in animal models of, um, of uh, vaccines against other coronaviruses, SARS coronavirus and MERS coronavirus, that there was this phenomenon observed in, in, in some settings, in some animal models of antibody dependent, and enha dependent enhancement where vaccinated animals had worse outcomes uh, than non-vaccinated animals. It's a theoretical risk. It may not be a primary issue and it may not, but, but it's out there in the community. There's, there's concern about it, both real and perceived. Um, and not just that, even something that, that may be coincidental, a, a, a reporting of a sudden rise of early pregnancy loss, for example. Uh, th those are real issues that we need to address right now with transparency, with openness, with the right types of surveillance, uh, the science infrastructure for pharmacovigilance and it's only through that kind of conversation and good science that that we can really build trust so i just wanted to reflect on that but ne next slide um so people are asking about what global mechanism will be in place to to ensure a fair and equitable distribution um you know we've addressed already uh, in this talk uh, the variability in potential strategy endpoints uh, the variability in priorities and the different needs among countries We've also spoke about different needs within countries and, and variability in attitudes for, for subpopulations within countries. We also spoke about the wide range of products and how their performance characteristics differ. So there's lots of variability. Uh, and when there's lots of variability, there's lots of uncertainty. And with lot, when there's lots of uncertainty, it's difficult to make the required investments, particularly when those investments are as massive as they are at the moment. So there's an attempt to kind of share the, share the risk uh, and balance out that risk and, and allow the required investment. So what we have here, uh, um, this, this came out about six days ago, really, for, for a, a Gavi, from Gavi, uh, to describe uh, the so-called COVAX facility. Um, there are three uh, main pillars uh, that we're only discussing the vaccine pillar. Clearly, there are issues around diagnostics and therapeutics as well, not the subject of today's talk. But when it comes to vaccine development and delivery, there are three underpinnings, uh, three uh, 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 work streams, perhaps, that. Uh, uh, underpin vaccine uh, delivery. One is the development and manufacturing of a vaccine, which we touched on a bit, and that's coordinated by, uh, by CEPI. Uh, policy, making the right policy and how uh, allocation of vaccine will occur, that's managed by the WHO. Procurement and delivery uh, at scale to countries, uh, that's being managed by Gavi through uh, what's called the COVAX facility. So next slide, please. Um, the COVAX facility really is a way of bringing together, this is a slightly modified uh, 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 graphic from, from the Gavi publication, uh, that brings together uh, the participating countries and understanding what their needs are and so that we have an advanced commitment to purchase with the manufacturers so that they can safely go ahead with the required investment to produce, uh, given the risks that are involved in the ultimate market. And the COVAX facility, together with advanced market commitment, makes some of this possible. Andrew, if you could click on the mouse, please. And um, of course, there's always this backhanded or back, I shouldn't say backhanded, it's a bit pejorative, but back channels that, you know, uh, would circumvent this facility. And, and we needn't see them in negative terms. I, I think there are countries that need to have 
some kind of a controlled economy here, but there's also the free market and, and, and the, the invisible hand, so-called, of the market. Right? Um, there are, the COVAX facility perhaps has a place when the market might be expected to fail, but efficiencies might be achievable through open markets. So the degree to which we, we allow for free markets and, and managed markets, command economies and so on, these are clearly very political issues uh, and, um, and are slightly beyond the scope of this talk, but I just wanted to bring in the complexity of, of these decision making. The, the other thing is that the, you know, this was a Gavi thing and Gavi traditionally looks at low income countries, but uh, I think somebody in the chat already pointed out that it may very well be middle income countries that are most affected. Next, next slide, please. So when you think about how um, the, these pillars, they almost look like silos and even the underpinning rubrics underneath it, they're, they're being managed by three different organizations. And that's partly because the workload is just so great that no single organization can manage it all. But there is a risk that um, there will be a disintegration or a lack of sufficient communication among these things. And really what we're trying to do today is to think about how all of these different levels of, of focus and all the variability at each level can be integrated um, both globally, but most importantly at, at country level. Next slide, please. If we think about how to integrate the ideas, um, you know, we've already presented this Chevron uh, image before and, it, 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 and all the questions that arise from each of these targets, there may be specific ways that we can think about them and, and have, have a matrix of ideas that integrates together. So you consider slightly more complicated than normal Rubik's cube uh, to think about all the possible decisions along each facet of our decision-making process. Lois, uh, maybe you can describe this uh, further as well. Yeah, and um, so, so going into a little bit more detail about the Rubik's Cube, now the, the Rubik's Cube needs to meet the needs of the various strategies in the Chevron. But uh, one of the concepts here is that understanding the things that will impact success in being able to deliver a vaccine and you know, success, successfully meet the strategies that have been laid out. So one of the things that we've done is we've done some benchmarking research to understand what are some of the bottlenecks and what are some of the, the timelines or the experience that we've had looking at other vaccines. So one of the things, uh, so what we saw in this particular study, and this was done in uh, Gavi countries, taking a look at the time from first licensure to introduction into a country and then eventually uptake, there are some milestones that are really important and some bottlenecks that we can identify and these correspond to the various sides on the Rubik's Cube. So what we saw was that on average, most vaccines took around uh, more than five years to be able to make it into the countries that needed it most. There was some good news, but um, when we're considering it in the context of COVID today, it actually doesn't sound as good as we thought it was at the time. And that's uh, the example of meningitis A vaccine, another epidemic vaccine. There was a length of time between the first licensure and seven months to get it into the country, which is really quite fast but we have to think about what can we do today to make this faster. So um, you look at some of the things and uh, look at what are the implications of demand and what are some of the considerations that we'll need to be uh, thinking about, particularly as most countries have a focus on childhood vaccination programs and although some have experience with adults, that is something that you know could be a potential bottleneck. The other bottleneck were the other bottlenecks were mainly around delivery strategies, and this includes everything from the capacity to make decisions. So these are some of the countries um, were able to make these decisions well in advance. So that's a best practice, but things like tracking who gets the vaccine, um, you know, are there registries, do we have cold chain capacity and logistics or, or policies around who can administer vaccines? Because particularly in emergency settings, you may want to look to different ways of doing things normally, but we need to consider that these are regulated environments and you can't just change things on the fly. So there's got to be a process there. Ethics and politics are something that uh, we've seen have been quite divisive in today's world. 
And it's a reality more than ever that you know countries recognize this as as an, a strategy to impact not only uh, health but their economy and social justice. The products themselves can have an impact on uh, which countries the vaccines are even appropriate for. So it may be that um, timelines get delayed till we wait for a vaccine that perhaps is more thermostable or has fewer doses or a different profile that fits what's needed in a particular country. Supply and uh, financing was one of the most common reasons why there are delays for uh, vaccines and vaccine delivery. Ensuring that there is a fair allocation will be a really big um, consideration. And when I talk about financing, it's not just financing for the vaccine itself, it's also financing for the system that has to deliver it. And then finally, in terms of program uh, priorities, one of the things that we've seen with other vaccines is the need for that global country dialogue and making sure that there is a coordination at all levels and not just at the national level within a country, but a subnational level. Next slide. Yeah, so we've introduced this concept of the conceptual matrix of the planning considerations. I want to extend outwards the, 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 so this notion to really a matrix or, or, or the, the, the orbit of required actions that arise. What are the things that we need to consider, but then also to do and to really start doing now so that the right infrastructure is in place by the time a vaccine might be available. And again, just very quickly moving counterclockwise, I mean, these are um, you know, the parallels of what Lois has just described, but uh, you know, what do we need to do um, to think about demand? And, and what, are we, what are we doing now about acceptance, uh, listening to concerns of the public, getting those different perspectives of individual communities, getting communities to advocate, perhaps communities that may be at high risk or communities that may otherwise be left out of the conversation in the normal context, now's the time to really engage uh, and, and have the, the, the capacity to uh, integrate those views. Now might also be the time to set up the pharmacovigilance and have that pre-surveillance uh, that is required if uh, somebody is to look at a pre-post uh, change in, in, uh, in event rates for adverse effects. Um, in terms of delivery, so again, moving counterclockwise, um, well, we've already said we need to have um, perhaps a register of older adults. We need to think about who will deliver the vaccine. Can we have not necessarily highly trained healthcare workers who are busy delivering acute care? Perhaps we can have self-administered vaccines. Perhaps we can have vaccines that are deliverable by people with more limited training. Uh, perhaps we can even employ some of the very many unemployed uh, in helping to deliver those things. The ethics and politics, again, a lot of it is about communicating and a lot of it is, a lot of it is about listening to the particularities on the ground. I, I, just stepping out of this uh, particular topic, I want to speak more broadly for one second about the whole idea of epidemiology, really, and translational epidemiology is about the particular and the local. It's not about, you know, traditionally the central limit. It's not about the description of the whole. It's about what will work in practice in this particular community in this time. And that's an ethical approach because we're listening to what are the concerns of the people, uh, what, are, what are the political considerations. The same has already been said about product. We don't need to go into it again, but you know, how do we store, how do we dispose and so on. Uh, again, what are the mechanisms that we need to put in place? We heard about this mechanism, the COVAX facility, which is a global one, but perhaps we also need to think about what are the things that need to be done uh, to make things affordable, reliable and efficient at a local level. Once we understand all of those things, we can really justify uh, the programmatic priorities that countries uh, come to in terms of the immediate goals, the longer term goals, and can coordinate uh, cross-sectoral discussions. It's not just health, it's not just finance, it's not just, uh, uh, some countries might wanna take a military approach to, to delivery. Some countries might involve the education sector. These are the things that we need to bring into this matrix. Next slide. Um, so just to you know, pull, push your imaginative capacity one, one step further and, and to stretch this analogy, really we have a universe of, of different combinations. Different countries will come up with different solutions. Even if they take the same framework, the final combination of, of factors will be unique for each country. The topology work will help to align some of those groupings so that we have uh, like and like and countries can learn from each other and the global, the central community can help uh, reach uh, like countries with similar policy. But we, we have this universe, and the universe is shifting and changing and orbiting, depending on the circumstances. 
And I, I just, again, by way of analogy, I, I, unlike a normal universe where the center of gravity is the sun or is the black hole in the middle, you know, here the center of gravity really is peripheral. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is something that we want the, 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 the particular and the local to be the focus of our, of our gravity and to inform then the central planning uh, that occurs uh, in the middle. Lois, any comments on this uh, analogy? No, no, it's perfect. And, and when I go into the next slide, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit further because it really does require an integrated response from global to local and creating different, uh, bringing in different perspectives. We um, have general stakeholders that we work with that are used to sitting at the table that have a lot of experience and we, um, you know, we want them there, but we have to look outside the box. We really need to think about who are the non-traditional players that may provide some innovation and some answers to get past where we are right now. And this really needs to be viewed as an opportunity for uh, future vaccines. So it's not just for COVID-19, but uh, for everything moving forward, are there opportunities to bring in different types of thinking and making sure that more of the vulnerable people have access to vaccines? So bringing in those voices is gonna be absolutely crucial. Well, that's why the box is fenestrated. It's uh, organic and, uh, you know. Yeah. So why don't we just go to, to the final slide, which is the, the framework uh, uh, for, uh, that we want to end with and integrating experiences and as I spoke earlier, new perspectives. Because as a global community, we should be asking certain questions. We should be asking how local conditions differ and what things are needed to achieve their success. We also should consider who is leading and whether the country voices with different perspectives, perhaps not from health, are sitting at the table, as I mentioned earlier, to mold thinking and strategies and remind us that this isn't just the public health issue, that it's the economic and social justice issue. On the country side, countries need to consider their Rubik's Cube and whether they have planned for all the considerations that have impacted that impact delivery in their populations. They should ask whether they have stakeholders that should be providing input to achieve their goals. So this isn't just something that happens at, at a global level, but it also needs to happen in country and down to the subnational level. And we need to make sure that the global country communication is really there. This is a complicated cut, uh, puzzle. And we don't have all the solutions yet. There's a lot of really great questions that I'm excited to uh, see if we can start tackling some of those uh, to answer and um, really uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk you, to you about this. And I'll turn it back over to Maria. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Lois and Noor and, and really everyone for all the excellent comments that you've been making in your questions. Uh, so um, we have received a lot of questions already and I've tried to group them. Feel free to continue adding more questions into the Q&A box and um, continue adding your comments in the chat box. We'll try to monitor both. Uh, so uh, Lois, maybe I'll start um, with a question to you. Um, this is a vaccine related question regarding characteristics. Um, and there's, there's two here, so I have a follow-up. Um, are developers considering vaccines that do not require cold chains? So we, we need to remember that there's a variety of different uh, technologies out there, a variety of different candidates, I think over 160 or so. So it's a huge number of possibilities out there. And Products that can be kept out of the cold chain are of course desirable. And that is something that some companies are considering, but there's uh, different phases of development and we may not see that in the first tranche, tranche of, of vaccines that come out there, but it is certainly one of the areas that, uh, that the companies are looking at to see what they can do to provide their most stable products. I just want to quickly add that this is the third coronavirus global outbreak we've had in the last 20 years, and it may not be the last. So the lessons learned from this is the first major yeah. global pandemic, but 
there are lessons learned. We'll do better next time if there is a next time. Let's hope there's not. Okay, the, and another follow-up question to that, it's about the efficacy of, of the vaccines. So will the recently developed or the ones that are now being developed um, be effective against uh, potential future mutational strains of COVID-19 disease? And there's been a lot of questions about how well they're gonna work in older adults when they've only been tested on 18 to 55 year olds. Um, look, I'll jump in with that. Um, I don't have the answers and I'm not a virologist uh, and I'm, I'm not a particularly good immunologist, but um, <laughs> uh, I'll just say that, um, you know, the ideal vaccine would be a vaccine that protects us against all future coronaviruses. Um, uh, but, but the ideal or, or, you know, the perfect that can be the enemy of the good and, and our main aim is to target the problem that we have right now. Uh, if we can develop a pan-corona vaccine and among the 160 or so candidate vaccines, there are some out there, that, um, that look at, um, at that, but, but they're not the leading candidates. Um, I wouldn't wait for that to happen. Um, I think there are lots of lessons that we can learn both in terms of the stuff we're talking about today, but also immunologically, um, and we need to get a vaccine that works against the problem that we have at the moment. Um, if we can develop a pan-corona vaccine, that would be wonderful. Uh, and if we can't, which is slightly more realistic, then that's okay also. Um, but the mechanisms, the platforms, the infrastructure that's, that's put in place the new technologies that have arisen, I mean, this has been super fast uh, in terms of both the, the evolution of the science has been so rapid. Um, we're going to learn a lot. And so hopefully we'll be more ready uh, should this uh, occur in the future. It may end up that we have a seasonal style vaccine. Uh, you know, if COVID doesn't go away or if COVID mutates, then there may be, and we may need to tweak our vaccine approach, but um, uh, we, the future will tell. And I, I think the the other part of the question was about testing in, in older adults and that it hasn't been tested in an older population. I think we need to remember that, that first, um, there's different phases of testing. So we haven't fully reached the full expanse of age groups that it will be tested in. The target product profile coming from uh, WHO is including these older age groups. So there will need to be some, uh, some evidence showing how well it works in those age groups and whether it's immunogenicity or whether it's effectiveness, um, I think that's, that's something that we still need to consider. And it feeds into this question of what a pragmatic clinical trial should look like and who should be included. And I wanna to refer to Ruth Karen's work on, on the Ebola virus vaccine and the inclusion of pregnant women, for example. That, that's the same kind of uh, conceptual framework that needs to be applied here. If, we've got a, if, if our target population here is older adults, then we need to know that things work and are safe in older adults, or at least which product might particularly be good and for, for, for older adults. Yeah. Um, in other, um, I guess, uh, outcomes that you would measure for clinical trials, one of course is safety. Um, there's a question about whether surveillance, as in AEFI type surveillance, um, is going to be needed prior to the introduction. And then maybe you can fold that into a general conversation about safety um, regarding communication hesitancy and trust issues. There were lots of questions about what assurances are there going to be about both the safety and the efficacy. Um, what proof is there about uh, evidence that there's no conspiracy about the chips, suspicion about the Chinese inactivated vaccine that's going into phase three and how to deal with that, et cetera. Yeah. So look, I'm gonna jump straight into this because I'm dangerously opinionated about this topic. <laughs> um, I think it's really, really important that as scientists and as public health practitioners that we have an open and completely transparent discourse about risks and benefits, that we work as hard as we can to establish the surveillance systems, in, especially in low-income countries where they're often lacking, um, so that we can really address concerns, whether they're perceived concerns, real concerns. And, and I think we've spent too long pontificating to, pop, to populations about what's right and wrong. And it, it makes us deaf to hearing voices, still small voices that we need to be attentive to and not to necessarily uh, call them wacko or way out or whatever. Um, you know, this issue of microchipping that you mentioned, you know, it sounds like a wacky thing. It's not a wacky thing. My great grandmother, grandmother, I should say, had a number tattooed on her arm. These are real things in the experience of people. People are not numbers and people are concerned about being seen as real uh, human beings with concerns and with, uh, we, you know, that are treated, who are listened to and heard. And I think that's, that's the starting point. But the mechanisms, the systems are there. We're seeing now in the US, it's not enough to have the attitudes. It's about 
the systems that are in place that lead to inequity. If we can have the mechanisms in place to look at real safety in the populations that are otherwise not, in, not included, in the elderly, in the young, in pregnant women, and so on, then we can really be, we can be the ones informing the public. There's a signal of concern here, we need to respond to it. Not to be on the back foot and be responsive to, 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 uh, to concerns uh, that, that, that come out of left field. So if we set up those mechanisms and we don't isolate extreme views and we engage in conversation and we have in include into the conversation people with hesitant concerns, not think about them, Patrick, not think that we're disseminating the truth outward, but that this really has to be a global conversation. Trust comes from you know, equality uh, and, and, and openness and discourse. And if we can achieve that, then we'll go a long way to improving health systems generally, not just for COVID-19. The mechanisms have to be in place to do that. I'll shut up now because too much of people. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Uh, maybe Lois, you can uh, tackle this beast, which is whose role is it? There's a lot of questions that fall into this category. I'll read a couple. How can international healthcare NGOs make themselves available to assist with distributing of a vaccine in developing countries? Should vaccine delivery be predominantly handled by national, state, local governments, and in-country CSOs? Which organization will be responsible to bring the vaccine into the country? Is it important for donors to have hands, a hands-on approach? Will they take over implementation instead of governments to drive campaigns? Wow, that's a lot of questions there. So I, I, think, I think at the crux of all of this, um, and some of these, I've been seeing conversations offline about uh, CSOs and their engagement in the whole process. And, but there's a number of different stakeholders. I think the answer is largely is it depends. It depends on the, the context in which uh, the, the CSO or the stakeholder is, is going. I think what's really important is that it's everybody's responsibility to raise the issues, to start the dialogue and to start talking to their local health authorities because I think we need to be holding them accountable. We need to be saying that um, we want to be involved in this conversation and that's one of the ways that you build trust is that you know you get people engaged and get people to come up with you know joint, um, joint conversations and joint solutions. So you're coming up with more innovation. Now there's a lot of um, regulations out there and a lot of reasons why you wanna have certain people do certain things, but there are opportunities to do things in a different way. So it's, it's really the, the function of all of us to be saying that we wanna be engaged and we wanna to look to new solutions. We have two minutes left and I have another, uh, I think, um, big question. And it's about, um, if you can maybe t take it in the um, angle of financing, but really it's about access to low and middle income countries. And I think you should um, pay particular attention to the middle income countries because they often um, fall in the gap. Um, there's been talk about uh, the benefit-based ANC proposed approach for um, middle-income countries. What are the action priorities for middle-income countries? And how can we guarantee access to COVID vaccines for low- and middle-income countries beyond the Gates Foundation and Gavi? So um, let, me, let me start with some of this. I, I think that you know the whole financing uh, thing is, is a big question and it's going to vary depending on you know, how strong the health system is. Because one of the things that we need to remember is that we're not just financing the vaccine. That's part of the battle. Um, that we're also needing to finance the mechanisms to get the vaccine to the places that they're needed most. So uh, the AMC goes a long way in making vaccine accessible. And even in middle income countries, being able to get a lower price for vaccines. So, so that's a positive thing. The other thing with AMCs is that we've seen that they've been able to shape the markets to make uh, prices decline. And, and there's some real great success stories out there in, um, mm -hmm. in a vaccine market shaping, not just through uh, AMC, but also through the efforts of groups like Gavi. So there's some good experience there. But for middle income countries, I think it becomes a different challenge because, um, you know, yes, they could access the vaccine at the lowest prices, but what are they going to do differently to be able to get 
to the most vulnerable populations. And I think at the crux of this, this is one of the major concerns. Yeah, and I'll just add to that, um, yeah, that you know, we've seen at least so far, and it may change, this paradoxical uh, mortality inversion, you know, where the, most of the mortality has been in high income settings. And so far, and hopefully let it stay that way, seen less relative mortality in low income settings. But it's the group in the middle, the, the middle income countries that both have, you know, moderately high and increasing mortality, um, and not necessarily the infrastructure that's able to support it. And those countries are outside of the Gavi traditional Gavi remit anyway. Before COVID-19, Gavi was thinking about whether it should be expanding to some of these countries, particularly on the low middle income end. But, you know, I think this has exacerbated, uh, exacerbated all of that. Um, you know, this is a challenge, and everybody says it, uh, unprecedented like no other, but, but the, the issue is that we have to make pragmatic decisions. We have to balance being, being right and, 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 and doing things well with doing things in the most pragmatic way. For example, if a vaccine is perhaps less, less efficacious, but much easier to deliver, then it'll be much more impactful if it can be delivered to a large number. It's absolute reduction in, in event rate will be higher, even if it's a relative reduction is, is more modest. So these are the kind of trade-offs that are not easy to articulate to a population. Why are we choosing a vaccine with 60% efficacy at, at single dose, then 80% efficacy, but requiring two doses, just to make up an example. You know, these are things that we need to speak about and we need to plan for and we need to inform the, uh, the, the, the world community about so that we can be part of a conversation together. Um, and that, that's, yeah, I'll stop there. And I, and I think we have to stop there. I think yeah. we're at the hour. There are quite a few um, more questions in here for us to answer. So what we're gonna try to do is respond to, to all of these. Um, we're gonna um, send that around in an email along with the recorded version of this talk. So I, I personally wanna thank everybody. This has um, not been boring for us. This has been <laughs> all, um, uh, really engaging to see all of your comments and your questions as they've been coming in and really appreciate um, that active engagement from all of you. And I think reminding people that our emails are on the last, uh, the last slide, you'll see them in the message coming through, but uh, please feel free to reach out to us.